Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, another synthetic Zoom there. Today we have uh, three 20 minute research talks and our first speaker is Mohan Swaminathan from Princeton University and he's going to tell us about super rigidity and bifurcations of embedded curves in Calabria tree poles. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak in this seminar. So uh, just before I start, I just want to mention that Everything I'm talking about today is based on joint work with Xiaoyun Bai, who is also at Princeton. Um, okay, so here's uh, a short uh, overview of uh, the structure of the talk. So uh, the first section, I will cover some uh, background. So I will go over um, the uh, concept of super rigidity for embedded curves in Calabria three poles. Um, also briefly discuss uh, Wendell's theorem on generic super rigidity. Uh, then I'll also uh, talk about BPS invariants and the Gopal Kumar Wappa formula. And uh, we'll bring these three points together in the form of a motivating question, uh, which we will then try to answer partially in the second section. So the second section, I will talk about um, our results. So the first result we'll be talking about is uh, uh, bifurcations in moduli spaces of embedded curves when we take a generic one parameter family of almost complex structures. Um, the second result will be about uh, obstruction bundles and how their Euler numbers will change under such bifurcations uh, in some simple cases. And then uh, I'll bring these two together for um, an application. So the application will consist of defining BPS invariants in some specific cases. Um, so we will directly define some integer valued invariants by counting embedded curves with some weights. Uh, we will show that these are symplectically uh, invariant and then show that they also satisfy the Gopal Kumar Wappa formula. Okay. Um, and then finally, I will end with, uh, uh, I will end with describing some further directions we plan to take this uh, research in. Okay, so let's uh, get started. So uh, let's start by fixing a closed symplectic Calabria threefold X omega. So by this, I just mean X is six dimensional and C1 of TX is zero. Uh, so now given any compatible almost complex structure J, uh, a non-negative integer G and a homology class A, we can form the moduli space of genus G stable J holomorphic maps to X. Uh, in class A and um, a simple Riemann rock computation shows us that the virtual dimension of this moduli space is zero. So then uh, uh, some virtual fundamental class machinery uh, and so on kicks in and we can get a, a gramma witten invariant, uh, which I'm denoting GW of A comma G. And this is a rational number, which is supposed to count morally the number of points in this moduli space. And it's an important fact that this is independent of J and in fact, um, even a deformation invariant of omega. Okay, but now I want to immediately point out that this Gromovitan invariant is not Z valued, but only Q valued. And this is because in general, we are going to have multiple covers. Every time we have a holomorphic curve, we can also take all its multiple covers. And this means that the moduli space is uh, hardly ever going to be cut out transversely. And so, uh, and moreover, I mean, curves with automorphisms have to be counted with weight one over the size of the automorphism group, even if they happen to be isolated in the moduli space. And so, um, so these invariants are not in any obvious way enumerative. Uh, so in particular, they don't take values in Z. Okay, so now uh, uh, let's start with uh, this uh, basic fact, uh, which I will assume for the rest of the talk. So, uh, so away from a co-dimension two subset of the space of compatible almost complex structures, I have the following property. All simple holomorphic curves are embedded and they're all pairwise disjoint. So in other words, uh, if they are not the same uh, simple curve, then they in fact have disjoint images. So I'll restrict to uh, such J for the rest of the talk. And uh, I will be at most considering one parameter families of J's. So this is not an additional assumption at all because by a generic perturbation, we can avoid this co-dimension to subset. Okay, so now for such J, we can uh, immediately note that any stable J holomorphic map 
must have its image on um, an embedded smooth geolomorphic curve. So, in a, uh, so more precisely, if f prime from sigma prime to x is any non-constant stable map, then we can factorize it uniquely as sigma prime to sigma, which is a map of Riemann surfaces. Sigma prime might be singular, but sigma is smooth. And f uh, from sigma to x is a smooth geolomorphic embedding. OK, so now, uh, having fixed such a J, uh, we can talk about super rigidity. So an almost complex structure J is said to be super rigid if it has the following property. So every time we have a stable J holomorphic map, um, sigma prime to X, which I factorize again as before. So sigma prime to sigma, that is the map phi followed by the inclusion of sigma into X. Um, we require that uh, the map sigma prime has no non-trivial normal deformations. Uh, so more precisely, let's say dn sigma comma j is the normal Cauchy-Riemann operator of the embedded curve sigma. Uh, then firstly, we require that this has no um, infinitesimal solution. So there is the kernel of dn sigma j is zero. But not only this, we also demand that this be true when we pull back to any multiple cover. So uh, that is the definition of super rigidity. So if we do have super rigidity, then what this tells us is that the multiple covers of sigma are actually an open and closed subset of the moduli space of holomorphic curves. Um, in fact, we can make the following slightly more precise statement. So if J is super rigid, then given any sequence of embedded JN curves, sigma N inside X of bounded genus and area, with Jn converging to J, we can find a subsequence which converges to an embedded geolomorphic curve sigma x. And the key point here is that we can take sigma in the limit to be embedded. And this will follow just by using Gromov compactness and then using the fact that if the limit of the sigma n's was a multiple cover, then we could rescale in the direction normal to the image of the limit and extract uh, an infinitesimal normal deformation which is prohibited by the definition of super rigidity. So the key point of super rigidity is that it allows us to separate embedded curves from multiple covers. So this suggests that maybe we could just try to count embedded curves on their own. So this will certainly give us an integer valued invariant, but then um, we need to ask if this would be um, actually an invariant of J. So before this, uh, we need to ask is super rigidity um, something we actually see uh, in real life or is it just an abstract definition? So, uh, so Wendell's breakthrough theorem from 2019 actually shows that uh, super rigidity is generic. So more precisely, it shows that uh, the subset of the space of almost complex structures compatible with omega where super rigidity fails has co-dimension at least one. So in particular, the complement consists of a set of bare second categories. So the generic J is super rigid. Uh, so for simplicity, I'm, I'm not stating the full version of Wendell's result, but the full version actually determines um, a stratification on this subset and determines the co-dimensions of the various strata. So these strata are classified by um, sort of what multiple covers super rigidity fails at, and then these covers are further classified by their Galois group. Uh, and also the representations of these Galois groups also play a role in defining the strata. So uh, this generic super rigidity result provides us with a strategy to define integer valued counts of embedded curves, provided we restrict to a super rigid J. Uh, but however, as I said earlier, we are not assured that this is going to be independent of J because in a generic one parameter family of J's, we might have uh, the loss of super rigidity when we cross one of these co-dimension one strata, um, which I'll refer to as walls. So we need to actually investigate what happens when we cross these walls in order to check symplectic invariance. Um, let me also mention another piece of motivation, and this is the Gopakumar Wafa uh, conjecture from 1998. So Gopakumar and Wafa uh, predicted from uh, physics that there exist integers BPS A comma H for each uh, non-negative integer H in homology class A, which satisfy the following uh, generating function identity. So 
the exact form of the identity is not important, but what is important is to notice that BPS is determined uniquely in terms of GW and vice versa by this identity. So if we wish, uh, we could take this as the definition of BPS, and then the conjecture becomes, are BPS defined by this generating function identity integers? And indeed, this is the case. So Yellen and Parker proved in 2018 that there actually exist unique integers BPS A comma H, which satisfy this Gopakumarova formula. Um, in fact, more is true. So recently, Doan, Yonel, and Walpuski have also shown that the BPS invariant satisfies uh, another property conjectured by Gopakumarova, which is that BPS of A comma H vanishes for sufficiently large H, provided we fix A. Okay, uh, but uh, an important point to note is that neither of these proofs actually show us how to interpret the integers BPS enumeratively. So, um, so therefore the motivating question that we had is how can we define integer valued symplectic invariants by counting embedded curves, possibly with some integer weights, and how are these counts related to the BPS invariants? Okay, so with this uh, motivation in mind, uh, let me come to the second section, which is our results. So our recent paper addresses some parts of this question. So for the first question, we study bifurcations in the space of embedded curves, which occur when we cross one of the walls from Wendell's theorem. So uh, this is what we need to study in order to check symplectic invariance. And for the second question, we need to make a comparison with the gromma witten invariants. So this means we need to understand how uh, the various obstruction bundles that go into the definition of the gromma witten invariant, um, how these change under such a bifurcation. So we describe precisely how uh, certain simple bifurcations influence the Euler number. Okay, so here's our first result on bifurcations. So um, let's say JT is a generic path of almost complex structures. And assume that at time zero, we have an embedded curve sigma, uh, which has the property that it itself is rigid, but it has a multiple cover, which is not rigid. That is, it has a non-trivial normal deformation. So let's say phi from sigma prime to sigma is a multiple cover, which has a non-trivial normal deformation. Um, let's also make the technical assumption that this curve determines an elementary wall type. So I'm not uh, elaborating on this too much, though I will write after the uh, statement. Then we can draw the following conclusions. So the first conclusion is that phi uh, has to have a very simple automorphism group, namely it is trivial or just Z mod two. And moreover, the change in the number of embedded curves when we move from negative T to positive T. Um, uh, so these embedded curves are of genus H and of class D times the class of sigma and we look only in a small neighborhood of this multiple cover phi, then the change in the number of embedded curves is plus or minus two or plus or minus one. So the latter case occurs precisely when the automorphism group of phi is Z mod two. Okay, so the technical condition of elementary wall type uh, is currently needed for our proof and it is satisfied by a large class of branched covers. So as an example, this includes all default covers sigma prime to sigma which have a Galois group equal to SD, the entire permutation group. So to get even more concrete, this includes all default covers of P1 to P1, which have the expected distinct number of branch points, 2D minus two. Okay, so let me say a couple of words about the proof of this result. So the key ideas actually already appear in the bifurcation analysis that is used to define Tobbs as Dromov invariant from 1996, which was subsequently proved to be equal to the cyber witten invariant. Uh, and using Wendell's theorem in our case, we are able to extend these uh, ideas to the branched cover case. So uh, to actually do the proof, we need to study the local structure of the stable map moduli space. So we take uh, genus H curves in class D times the class of sigma um, and the one parameter family JT. And we study the local structure of this moduli space near this point where, the, uh, where an infinitesimal deformation actually occurs. So we take a point J naught uh, comma phi, and we want to study the local structure near this point. And the way we study this uh, in a word is we first apply the implicit function theorem 
uh, as usual to obtain a local Kuronishi model for this modular space. Uh, but then once we obtain this model, we need to analyze the first few terms in the Taylor expansion of this Kuronishi map uh, in order to complete the proof. So basically we are able to uh, say enough about the Taylor expansion of this Kuronishi map that allows us to uh, figure out uh, how the number of embedded curves changes from T negative to T positive. Um, so here's a rough schematic picture of what the Kuronishi model looks like. So the domain of the Kuronishi model will consist of all the directions in which the infinitesimal deformations exist. So here T is the axis corresponding to variation of J. Epsilon is a coordinate on the kernel of phi upper star D. So where D is the normal operator. And Z1 through ZR are complex coordinates which represent um, the deformations of the branch points of the uh, branch cover. And here there are two components in the moduli space, namely Z and Z prime. So Z is sort of the trivial component which corresponds to just deforming the underlying curve sigma and attaching any branch cover to it. While Z prime uh, actually represents a genuinely new embedded curve. So what you can see here is that we have um, in this picture, sort of an embedded curve for each uh, t not equal to zero. So this is what is described in um, the proposition that I had earlier. And when we determine the signs, we find that the change is exactly plus or minus two. Okay, so here's my second result. So the second result is about obstruction bundles. So let's say we fix a compact Riemann surface sigma of genus G and a complex vector bundle N of rank two on sigma, call it N, and uh, with degree 2G minus two. So think of the normal bundle of uh, a Riemann surface embedded within a Calabi out three pole. So then it would have rank two and degree 2G minus two. Uh, so then exactly as before, we define a Cauchy Riemann operator D on N to be super rigid if it has trivial kernel when pulled back to any multiple cover. So if we have a super rigid D, then we can define uh, the co-kernel bundle. Uh, so take the space of genus H uh, default covers of sigma, so or, or rather the stable map compactification of this, and define a bundle on this by associating to each branch cover phi the co-kernel of phi upper star D. So by assumption, this is going to be of constant rank because the kernel is zero. And this forms what's called the obstruction bundle or the co-kernel bundle associated to this operator D. Moreover, you can check that the rank of this bundle is the same as the virtual dimension of the moduli space on which it's defined. So it has a well-defined virtual Euler number. So this is a rational number again, because of some orbifold behavior in the moduli spaces. And we want to study how this number changes when D undergoes a bifurcation. That is in a one parameter family when D loses super rigidity. Okay, so here's our result. So let's say script D is a generic one parameter family of Cauchy-Riemann operators on N. And let's assume uh, that the co-kernel bundle is well-defined and of expected dimension for all non-zero times. And at T equals zero, super rigidity fails at exactly a finite set delta. And it's very important as an assumption in this theorem that this delta occurs within the space of branch covers with smooth domain. So that's what is signified by looking at MH and not M bar H. Um, so under this assumption, we can describe how the Euler class changes from negative T to positive T. And we have a local to global type formula uh, of this kind. So the Euler class at positive T minus the Euler class at negative T is a sum of local contributions coming from each point in Delta. And this local contribution is two times a sign divided by uh, the size of the automorphism group. So the automorphism group in this case is just the automorphism group of the corresponding branched cover. Okay, uh, a, a very short word about the proof is that uh, the way we do this proof is we do a local finite dimensional reduction near each of these points or each of these bad points where super rigidity fails. And then we can check that uh, it reduces to a standard local model. And then we can compute the local contribution uh, to the change in the Euler class um, by looking at this local model explicitly in coordinates. Okay, so now let me come to uh, an application of the previous two results, um, which 
defines the Gopakumar Wafa invariant in a restricted case. So let's say A is a primitive homology class. Um, and let's assume that um, uh, uh, we want to define the BPS invariant for class 2A and genus 0. So then what we're able to show that this is a weighted count of embedded geolomorphic genus 0 curves of class 2A and A when J is super rigid. So more precisely, uh, let me try to explain what goes into the um, result. So we show that we can take two way curves and count them with the usual signs, but we also need to correct this naive sum by a certain weighted count of A curves. And maybe in the interest of time, I will not explain too much about how this weight is defined. Um, so the symplectic invariance of this definition follows from theorem A, where we check what happens when we hit one of these walls. Um, and then, the verification of the Gopakumar Wafa formula uses how the Euler class of the obstruction bundles changes, along with the Aspinwall Morrison formula, which is which gives us a standard computation of the obstruction bundle Euler class uh, in the integrable case. Okay. Um, finally, let me end with the further directions that we uh, want to explore. So we are not able to give a complete answer to the motivating question uh, because of the following obstacle: uh, our bifurcation analysis is only able to deal with uh, so-called elementary wall types. Um, and so we need to extend beyond that and include other cases such as the following. So we need to include non-minimal covers. So by this, I mean um, covers where uh, a kernel for the normal operator appears, but these are not the minimal such cover. Namely, there is an intermediate cover where a kernel already appears. So right now we are not able to deal with such covers. Um, then we, we aren't able to deal with branched covers where not all branch points are distinct. So part of the definition of elementary is that the number of branch points is the expected number. So each of them has simple ramification and so on. And finally, maybe the te technically most challenging is uh, nodal covers, uh, which is uh, when we have a sequence of embedded curves, which might degenerate possibly um, to a nodal stable map. Let's remember that the image will still be just an embedded curve, but the domain might be a nodal uh, curve, possibly with ghost components. So we hope to address uh, all of these cases in future work. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks, thanks, Mohan, for the talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, would you be willing to go back for a moment to the picture of the bifurcation that you showed? Yeah, yes. Uh, so, is is the picture trying to represent accurately the tangent vectors of z prime, or? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So maybe let me tell you what is true. I don't know how accurate the picture is. So so uh, z prime has a property that its projection to the epsilon axis is a local diffeomorphism. Yes. So it, it's supposed to be thought of as the graph of a function uh, from the epsilon axis to the others. Namely, T and Z1 through ZR are written as functions of epsilon along uh, capital Z prime. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of, I'd expect it to be actually tangent to the epsilon axis, although. Uh, well, we. We don't, uh, we're not able to show that, but I don't think we need it either. We, uh, yeah. Yeah, what we're able to show is that uh, Z prime is the graph of a function uh, from epsilon to the Z and T variables. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask about this, so am I right in thinking that for your elementary wall types, um, the epsilon in this picture really is only one real variable. Yes, and not, that's can't correct. be more. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes. So your your kernel is always precisely one dimensional here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so that's part of the definition of uh, elementary. Uh, so right now we are able to deal with only that case. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, 
maybe you can comment about this assumption, uh, statement about automorphisms, which was in your main theory. So, so why this automorphism of phi belongs to Z two, Z Z mod to Z? Yeah. So, so, uh, so this thing is was not part of the assumption uh, directly, but it's sort of implied by this uh, elementary wall crossing condition. So, elementary essentially, it, it's a bunch of conditions. One of them is that the branch cover has exactly the expected number of branch points. So each ramification has to be a simple ramification. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this already implies that if it's a branch cover, then I mean, automorphisms th uh, that will fix this branch point have to lie within Z mod two. Uh -huh. So it's kind of a sort of a consequence of the much stronger fact of being an elementary uh, bifurcation. So yeah, it's just a byproduct of the definition, even though we don't assume it a priori. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, th th thank you. Mm -hmm. So is the next speaker ready? Are there any other questions? I think that